We at the Tel Aviv International Salon are very excited to have had such an excellent talk tonight. And we are not finished yet. We have a load of questions that you, the audience, submitted in advance. And in order to parlay those questions, we have a very, very prominent Israeli journalist amongst us. Amit Segal is a columnist, a radio host, a television personality, a writer. He does it all. And he is one of the most influential journalists in the country. Please come to the stage. Well, I had a strange feeling because for the first time in my life, while hearing Ben speaking, I felt both old and slow. <laughs> so thank you for that, Mr. Shapiro. How are you? How is Israel? Thank God, it's amazing. It's terrific to be here. Let's talk business. <laughs> There is an old Chinese proverb, which I've just made up this morning, <laughs> saying that two things are hardest to translate, poetry and politics. And, and you try to make a comparison between Israel and, and the states, but there is a problem. And the problem is that we are very different. And I thought on my way here that if U.S. presidents were to be keyboard buttons, so Biden, Trump, and Obama would be control Z. They erased everything their um, predecessors ha had done before. But in Israel, it's the other way around. I mean, Bennett and Lapid are control C, copy-paste. <laughs> I mean, allegedly speaking, it is the government of change. And there is a heated debate about Bibi, like there is a heated debate about Trump. But at the end of the day, when it comes to Iran, Gaza, settlements, economy, it's, it's more of the same. So which, first of all, how do you explain this? I mean, it's, it's like you in the States have two trains full of explosives come to each other, and we are the hyperloop. I mean, we are without oxygen. There are no, there are no issues. What is it? Well, I mean, I, I think that... That was a long question. It was, and I'm trying to suss out all the different parts of it, to be honest with you. Um, the, <laughs> you know, I, I think that... that when it comes to America, the, the idea that you know, each party sort of rolls back what the other has done is, is a result of the fact that everything is now done through the executive branch in the United States. No major legislation gets passed. That means that a president signs executive orders, the next president comes in, and he reverses all those executive orders. And this, this process just continues uh, apace. Uh, you know, in, in Israel, it, it seems to me that the you know, lack of, of issues to argue over in, in some ways, that is just a reflection of the massive success that you've seen in this country. The, when, when you have presidents who are sort of bouncing back and forth, erasing everything their predecessor has done. If, if in Israel, the, the real problem is that it's hard to identify the differences between everything everybody is trying to do. What that really speaks to is the fact that there is greater unity than there's ever been in the history of the state of Israel, which you see. I mean, when you, like I was here in 2000. Right, when I, when I, the, the first time I visited Israel, I was 16 years old. We came in 2000, it was right after Arik Sharon had gone up onto the Temple Mount onto Harbait. And I mean, there was an active left in the state of Israel that was promoting the idea that East Jerusalem should be given away. Ehud Barak was actively promoting that. That's unthinkable today. I mean, the, the Israeli public has woken up to this. I mean, the simple fact is that when I look at Knesset, now obviously there's a, a, a difference between Yair Lapid and Naftali Bennett and, and Bibi Netanyahu. But when I look at the, the constituency of the Knesset, what I see is a Knesset in which the left barely has a place. The left does, and merits and labor used to be dominant parties in Israel. Now they essentially don't exist. Yes. Don't be too sad about that, by the way. Oh, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite pleased. <laughs> exactly. Um, but there is another thing about it. I mean, you know, we already had our January 6th, and it was in Janu on January 6th, 1952, when hundreds of protesters from the right wing actually stormed the Knesset with stones, led by Menachem Begin, the soon-to-be prime minister. We had heated debates, Sharon, going to the Temple Mount, the disengagement plan, Oslo Accords, Rabin was murdered. But now, I feel we are like the states 20 years ago when you could, couldn't even find a, you know, 
the slightest difference between Al Gore and George Bush, for instance? I think that that's true, although I, I would actually argue that the, the big differences in the United States, you're right, that they started to emerge after, after Bush and Gore, um, but, but the real beginning of, of major problems for the United States actually began to arise at the end of the Cold War, because the Cold War provided a unifying impetus inside the United States. At the end of the Cold War, that with the fall of the Soviet Union, the United States was the unchallenged global hegemon, and, and that meant that there was you know, th there were going to be new arguments in which people sort of went after one another. In Israel, almost the precise reverse occurred. After Oslo, you saw the rise of this m really serious post-Zionist movement that basically said that Israel didn't even, why should it exist? Should it exist? These questions were really being asked in the late 90s when I was a teenager. Uh, and then, because it's now clear that there are existential threats on every border, the Israeli public has unified and understands the, the level of the threat. So there is something to the idea that an existential threat directed at a, at a democracy helps unify the people who, who exist inside that democracy. It, and maybe the rise in, in the discourse about economy and even gender in Israel is due to the fact that to, to the fact that this conflict is here to stay. I mean, Ehud Barak once defined it as the villa in the jungle. Um, and then he offered to evacuate half the villa, but <laughs> it's a different <laughs> issue. And, and for many years, Israelis wanted to actually, th they stared from the window of the villa through the jungle. They spoke about the animals, the snakes, the elephants, etc. And all of a sudden, during the, the Arab Spring that turned to a, an Islamic winter, they found out that no matter what they want, even if they evacuate half the villa, they will never get peace from the jungle. And then they started to speak about the villa, about the electricity prices, uh, the window, etc. So I want to ask you, how can Israelis seriously discuss economy when the discourse is focused on the Palestinian question? I mean, how can you expect Likud not to join forces with the unions um, when, when it should try and get support to annex the territories, for instance. Yeah, I mean, again, Israel is, is sort of a, an odd political constellation of forces. In the United States, the, the traditional sort of characterization of US politics has been that the right is social conservatives, economic liberals, and foreign policy hawks, and the left is the reverse of all those positions. In Israel, you have this sort of bizarre situation where you have folks who are economically you know, very much to the left, but socially very much to the right. right? You have heavy welfare dependence in Haredi communities and also in Arab communities, and, and this crosses you know, all sorts of boundaries, and that, that, that creates a lot of cross currents that are very difficult to, to navigate. You know, my recommendation for a long time when it comes to Israel is that Israelis need to start seeing economics as a national security issue, that they actually need to link the two. So I think that what you're talking about <laughs> is a sort of de-linkage in which, okay, well, we have to make concessions here, we have to make concessions there in order to solidify security in Yehuda Vishomron. And the reality is that if you want to solidify security in Yehuda Vishomron, you actually need a stronger economy. If you want a, a more aggressive foreign policy, if you want a, a policy that is stronger in the face of, of predators, you need a stronger economy that is rooted in the vitality of the Israeli of the Israeli people. And th this is, to me, the, the single biggest takeaway that, you know, as an American, I have for, for Israelis. Israel has for a very long time counted like Blanche Dubois in, in Streetcar Named Desire on the kindness of strangers. We'll go around and we'll sort of beg everybody to be nice to us and the nicer we are, maybe that, the nicer they'll be to us. The reality is that as Israel is now seeing with regard to the Sunnis, everything in foreign policy is a power game. And Israel has a couple of resources as, at its disposal. Obviously its military is one, but that's a last resort. The first resource at its disposal is this unbelievable IQ Right, the Israel has unbelievable skill sets. Israel has an incredible group of, of people who are highly educated and willing to work and incredibly innovative. And not unleashing that in order to solidify Israel's place on the world stage is such an unbelievable mistake. No matter whether you are Arab or whether you are Haredi, no matter what you are, if you wish to see a stronger Israel, the first thing you have to do is recognize that in a, in a competitive world, you must strengthen your own economy. It's a lesson Biden is not learning right now in foreign conflict. It's something that Israel should, should pick up on. By the way, no one, I, I mean, Many people criticize Joe Biden for shaking hands with uh, the ruler of Saudi Arabia who actually murdered the Khashoggi the journalist, but a day before, Biden shook hands with uh, Mahmoud Abbas this who actually right. murdered a journalist and funds hundreds of terrorists and murderers, and no one said a word. Which demonstrates, by the way, that whenever you see the media in the United States particularly ranting and raving about moral questions, it's very rarely about moral questions. It's usually them telescoping their own perceived politics into a moral question that they're sort of making up. I mean, Joe Biden fist bumping with MBS 
is MBS a wonderful person who you'd want to babysit your children? Probably not. Is MBS an, a leader who's actually attempting to modernize his own country and make peace with the Jews for the first time in the history of the state of Israel? Yes, he is. And the same people in the media who are criticizing Biden for fist bumping MBS. Listen, there are a lot of reasons to criticize Biden for, for fist bumping MBS. I mean, it's politically tone deaf that we wouldn't, the, the United States wouldn't be reliant on Saudi oil if you would allow people to drill, all the rest of that. But the same people who are criticizing this are also in favor of Joe Biden making concessions to the Iranian terror state, which has subsidized the murder of some 2,000 American soldiers in Iraq. So there is no moral ground for them to stand on here. You've Exactly. And one thing for sure, Yuval Dayan the singer would have never shaked the MBS hands. <laughs> anyway, and the, this is the singer that didn't shake uh, Biden's hands. Anyway, um, he spoke about the economy and, and actually the, the idea of free markets. But then five minutes later, he spoke about the need for the United States to, to actually hug religion. And, and in Israel, many people, many people wonder how you could support free market as a right winger and then tax Israelis for actually having budgets for Jewish religion. Okay. How, do you, how, do you, how do you settle those two contradicting ideas? So, I mean, obviously, public education as a, as a, at a baseline ought to have elements of Judaism in a Jewish state. If you're talking about the, the conflict in, in terms of subsidization of for instance, yeshivas, for example. Synagogues, yeshivas. Yeah, I mean, I, I largely disagree with that policy of the Israeli government. I, 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 you know, as, a, as a religious Jew, I, I think that it's a mistake for <laughs> the religious community to be reliant on, on any state for its survival, including for subsidization. And I sympathize greatly with, with segments of the Israeli population who are sending their kids off to join IDF and then spending their taxpayer dollars to subsidize people who won't fight in the IDF. That, that doesn't make any sense to me. Okay. Let's talk uh, judiciary. There is a phenomenon in the States where the left found out recently that judicial activism is bad. <laughs> All of a sudden, welcome to the club now. I want to ask you, I mean, are we against judicial activism because it is bad or because it is used against us? Well, I mean, I'm against... Because in 10 years from yeah. now, I mean, the right wing will have a majority in Israel's Supreme Court. So, I'm against judicial activism because that's not the role of a judiciary. So, I, I fundamentally disagree that, for example, the overturning of Roe versus Wade is, is an act of judicial activism. It's not. If, if, if the definition of judicial activism is just overturning precedent, then it has no meaning because very often courts overturn precedent. The, the real question is whether there's even an attempt to read the law that's being construed. Exactly. If it is just a court that's deciding that its own politics trump whatever the law says, then you've got a real problem. And this is a major problem in Israel, obviously, because at least in the United States, we have a written constitution they could refer to when they're deciding what fundamental principles look like. In Israel, it seems the Supreme Court just makes up whatever the fundamental principles are and calls it basic law. But, well, I, I don't think anyone here has to be convinced that our um, system of uh, judges selection is good. But I'm not sure the American way of doing th the same thing is, is not even worse than that. I mean, when we take a look at the U.S. Supreme Court, all we see is yet another branch of the parliament. I mean, the Republicans vote for conservative decisions and the Democrats vote against. Can't we find something which is better than that? No. Uh, and, and the reason okay, that you can't, I mean, you. And, 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 and the reason, <laughs> that, the reason that you can't is, is because whenever people purport to appoint allegedly objective and independent people, those people are never, never actually objective and independent. If you appoint an AG by third parties, it's very rare that that person is actually going to be objective and independent in any way. And if you appoint a Supreme Court by people who are politically motivated, but they are outside of government, doesn't make them any less political. It's just a, it's just a, a ruse. It's a, it's a sort of mythology that you've created around the Supreme Court that's apolitical when you have the, the justices along with the bar association picking. I'd rather at least have the transparency of knowing that when I vote for political parties that through the system, at least there's some level of responsivity over time. Okay. You spoke a lot about hatred and anti-Semitism almost as a rule of history, and it's true, you know, many Jews in Germany of the 20th century or Spain of the 15th century felt that this is their home, that they, they are free citizens, that they live in a peaceful empire and then they found the Holocaust or the Inquisition, etc. And I want to ask you bluntly, do you ever wonder if one day you'll have to flee the United States? 
I mean, I think that every Jew throughout world history who has a brain and knows history has always wondered if a country that is not a Jewish state is going to eternally provide them security guarantees and full citizenship, of course. I mean, that, that's, uh, I think, to, to think that that's why the existence of the state of Israel is the single greatest guarantor of my loyalty to the United States, frankly. Right? Because Israel exists, that means the United States is going to be a more welcoming place for me because Israel is there as a backstop in case anything should go wrong. But I feel you try to dodge the question. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll ask it, it uh, bluntly. <laughs> Why won't you make Aliyah to the state of Israel? Because you can take the night to think about it, uh, by the way. <laughs> because the fundamental principles of the United States are good, eternally good, and worth upholding. And my fight to do that as a Jew is deeply important, not just to people who are not Jewish, but particularly to Jews. So in other words, my Jewish mission does not conflict with my presence in the United States or my citizenship in the United States or my loyalty to the United States. Shouldn't Jews live in the state of Israel? Shouldn't all Jews live in the state of Israel? All Jews, the Jews. Jews should live where they can do the most, where they can be a light to the nations. And for me, as a person with millions and millions of followers in the United States, promoting what I think are values that are eternally good, living in, living in the United States is a point of, of, I think, morality for me. Okay. Let's talk about a fresh topic, Donald J. Trump. Um, in 2016, you were almost a non-Trumper or a never-Trumper, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't vote for Donald J. Trump. Right. You didn't vote to Hillary, for Hillary Clinton. No. But who, no. <laughs> um, to, this, to this lady from the Green Movement, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, in 2020, you voted for Trump. Why didn't you vote for him in the first place, and what changed your mind? Okay, so I, I gave several reasons for not voting for Trump in 2016. One was Donald Trump's deep and abiding character flaws, uh, which have not been alleviated at all. Uh, the, the second is that Donald Trump was extraordinarily unclear about what he actually was going to do politically. So he was on all sides of every issue with equal passion. Right? So, uh, so he would say on the one hand that, you know, I think that we should be definitely defending our friends in Israel. And then he'd be like, America should never spend money on foreign... So the, the, it, it, with the exact same amount of passion, right? <laughs> he, th this was his shtick. And so my math was essentially, I object to everything that is happening in 2016. That was my math. My math was, and I didn't live in a swing state to be granted. You know, I was living in California, so my vote really didn't matter anyway. But with that said, the, the you know, basic calculus was that if I didn't vote in that election, then as a public figure, I had made clear my disdain for all available candidates. Trump came in, and he governed way more effectively and way more conservatively than I thought he was going to. And but just a second. Let's stop before 2020. Sure. How was it? You have, you have an empire. You have built an, an, an amazing empire. Um, weren't you worried, even publicly, that by not supporting Trump, you lose your audience and revenues? Of course. I mean, that's why the, the, the kind of silly notion that, that people were taking a position not to vote, that that was done, done for the money, absolutely untrue. I mean, I took the position in 2016 because I fundamentally objected to the candidates that had been presented to the American public in 2016. And you paid the price for that. 100%, yeah. I mean, I lost a job for that in 2016 with Breitbart. Um, but the, but the, um, the, that math changed. I mean, when the evidence changes, if you don't change your mind, then you're not doing your job. And the evidence changed with regard to President Trump. President Trump came into office. He selected a bunch of justices who I thought were going to do a good job on the bench. The day that he, that he selected Neil Gorsuch, I, I literally put a MAGA hat on on air. Um, you know, President Trump obviously moving the embassy to Jerusalem was a massive, massive move. His sponsorship and negotiation of the Abraham Accords was an incredible history-changing move. Uh, he, he did a lot of things that I really liked. So when it came to 20, and, and that combined with the fact that the left completely and utterly lost their mind in the United States between 2016 and 2020 made my decision a lot easier come 2020. And then came 2021, January 6th. And when you see these, these horrifying pictures of people storming the Capitol Hill, sorry. <laughs> um, it wasn't the best, guys. Don't you think Democrats m might have been right about with this, some of their criticism towards Donald J. Trump? I mean, so... That's your answer, but what's I mean, Ben's answer? 
the, again, I said that I, I thought that he had deep and abiding character flaws in 2016. My opinion of his deep and abiding character flaws were not changed by his diarrhea addiction to Twitter. Uh, so, no, I mean, I, I don't, like, almost nothing about my opinion about Donald Trump changed at any point as, as sort of a human being. My opinions only changed as far as what policy I thought he was going to implement and then how durable I thought the constitutional boundaries were. And I thought that the, I, I will say, I think it is a major misstatement of fact to declare, as most of the world media has done, that the United States is on the verge of having its democracy overthrown on January 6th. I think it's absurd. You had 200, 300 morons who went into the Capitol building <laughs> attempting to do harm to people. They were cleared out within two hours. The vote took place under the auspices of Donald Trump's vice president, Mike Pence, and the auspices of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell of Donald Trump's party. People like Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, Republican Secretary of State, election officials in Arizona and Pennsylvania, Republican Secretaries of State, were rejecting him at every turn. The courts rejected all of his legal complaints. Does that mean that Trump acted well between November 4th and January 6th? I thought he acted horribly between November 4th and 4th and January 6th, I think that he was saying things that were not true. But the, the notion that Donald Trump was presenting a unique threat to the entire democracy, the most durable democracy in modern world history is, is absurd. We were so at no point in danger of the democracy being overthrown so by a dumbass wearing bullhorns in the Capitol building put his feet up on Nancy Pelosi's desk. It's ridiculous. So it's yet another protest in the United States of America. That's what you're saying to me, the January 6th I mean, Vince. we had an entire summer in which major cities burned in, in 2020, and oh. nobody in the media seemed to care. So the answer, by the way, but this, that's not an answer for but, both, but it's this, an answer for neither, meaning both exactly. of those things are super bad, right? And people who facilitate those things are doing something wrong. It's bad when Kamala Harris tries to bail out rioters in the middle of the Black Lives Matter riots of 2020, and it's bad when Donald Trump declares that the, the rioters of January 6th are, are fundamentally doing something patriotic. That's not true. Okay. What do you think about what the uh, former Israeli ambassador to the U.S. Ron Dermer once said, that Israel should put its political fortune on the evangelist community rather than on the reform Jewish community? I mean, just as a matter of blunt fact, that's true. I mean, that's a, that it's, a, it's an unfortunate reality of life in, in the United States that uh, reform Judaism as a branch does not see Jewish identity in a serious way as central. Uh, it, it, it's a very simple rubric for me. If, as a Jew, right, if, if as a Jew, your values are more in line with same-sex marriage, transgenderism, and abortion than they are with, for example, the safety and security of the state of Israel, I have serious questions about how you think about yourself as a Jew. And so if I'm looking at who's more likely to back Israel, by polling data, Jews in the United States are the single most atheistic group of quote-unquote religious people anywhere. It's because Jews obviously Save are... Save Korea, I think. What was that? Save North Korea. I yeah, think. I mean, the, 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 the Jew, well, what's weird about Jewish identity, obviously, is it has an ethnic side because halakhically Jews are ethnically Jewish, and then it has a, and then it has a religious side. So when people self-identify as Jews in the United States, that doesn't actually mean that they do anything that has anything to do with Judaism. It means that their, their last name ends in, in Berger Steen or something. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of people whose last names end with Berger Steen who fundamentally reject nearly all Jewish values and are secular leftists, and so they vote like secular leftists. Um, we are approaching to the questions from the audience, but I have one last question uh, from me. Uh, you quoted Hamilton, I think, so I want to quote the play Hamilton. <laughs> Do you one day want to, be, want to be part, or you want to be in the room where it happens? To be a candidate for a vice president, president? That sounds like hell. Um, <laughs> number one, running for office is a garbage business. You have to ask a bunch of people that you don't care very much about for large sums of money in order to run a campaign in which you have to fib about your core positions. And then if you win, you have to hang out in Washington, D.C. with politicians. All of this sounds horrifying. I, I, my life is pretty wonderful. I get to spend nearly all my time with my family. I get to say what I want for a living, and, I get to pay, I get, and I'm paid richly for doing so. So I'll stick with that at least until... Uh, I'll, 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 I'll stick with that and le at least until, I'm 38 right now, I'll stick with that at least until I'm of the average age of our president, so that gives me like seven or eight decades. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't hear a no. <laughs> okay. Okay, questions from the audience. Um, Daniel from Long Island, New York. Are you here? Regarding the Israel-Palestine conflict, what is the solution? Um, 
I mean, there is none, uh, <laughs> is the answer. And the Palestinian Authority is a terrorist group, Hamas is a terrorist group, Islamic Jihad is a terrorist group, and attempts to negotiate with terrorist groups are likely to end in failure. Ben Amsalem from the great city of Ashdod asks, how do you see the relationship between Israel and the U.S. 10 years from now? So I think that there's a massive political realignment taking place in the United States that is, is putting the Republican Party in much stronger position than it has been maybe at any point in my lifetime. The, the realignment of Hispanic Americans particularly into the Republican camp, the, the turning of the Republican Party into a party of sort of cross-racial working class people uh, is, is fundamentally changing. Uh, how politics works in the United States. And as the Republican Party gets stronger, I am hopeful both that it will govern because it is an extraordinarily pro-Israel party, uh, and also I'm hoping that the Democratic Party will learn its lesson and start moving to the right also. I mean, they can react in one of two ways to loss. They can either start moving more into the camp of the progressives, become more anti-Israel, or they can learn that they're gonna get shellacked repeatedly until they start acting more moderate. And if they start acting more moderate, then hopefully even the Democratic Party will go back to a time when, when we had two pro-Israel parties in the United States. David from San Fernando Valley asks, how do you manage pretty well the balance between learning Torah and being from and still taking all the pop culture? Um, I mean, obviously, uh, I don't learn enough Torah. Um, and uh, <laughs> I take in too much pop culture. Uh, the, the, yeah, the, the, the answer to me is that I read incessantly and thank God for Shabbat for a variety of reasons, including the fact that I spend an enormous amount of time both with my kids and reading on Shabbat. So that, that helps a lot. Okay. One last question, Leah from uh, Modi'in asks, what advice would you give to someone today who is looking to develop and expand horizons within an established in industry as you were when starting the Daily Wire? So you have to find a market advantage. In the United States, there's a real hole on the right when we started the Daily Wire in terms of right-wing media outlets. Basically, there's a monopoly for Fox News. There are a couple of big sort of right-wing websites like Drudge Report, which used to be a lot more right-wing. Uh, and we spotted an opening. We also were sort of first movers in the podcast industry. So I'll tell you, when we first constructed our business plan for Daily Wire, our projections were that we were going to make most of our money off, off programmatic ads run on the website based on share traffic. And I think we had slated my podcast to have maybe after a couple of years, 150, 200,000 downloads With a podcast? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, amazing. Uh, and... Um, and obviously now the podcast does a multiple of that. It has somewhere between two and two and a half million downloads a day. Uh, so we were... We, I think the key is you have to have a, a very consolidated decision-making process. We're not a publicly traded company. We don't intend on becoming a publicly traded company. We're not going to make ourselves subject to ESG and DEI requirements. Uh, and so because we have a very tight top structure, that means we can move really quickly and really aggressively, both on issues that we really care about and, and with business strategies we think are going to work. Okay. And you think it can work in Israel? It's a way narrower field. Only, I think, 8 million Hebrew readers worldwide. I mean, I, I do think that there is room for a significantly more robust right-wing media presence in Israel. For sure, for sure. Okay. I'm not, I'm not giving any hints, but we'll, we'll, we'll have to think about it over at Daily Wire. Absolutely. Ben Shapiro, thank you very much. It thank was you, a pleasure. Sir. Ben, Ben, before you go, one thing.